Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am your host, Courtney Anderson. Today we have a show that is part of our Educators Eden series. And I love this series, of course, because education is one of the most important, powerful, fundamental, and exciting uh, parts of my life. And I, I just absolutely positively am thrilled that we have an opportunity in this series to share amongst educators, to support educators, to appreciate educators, and to help individual and collective groups of educators work toward their own little bit of paradise, their own little bit of Eden, where they're able to serve this incredibly important task of transferring knowledge and that they're also able to do so in a way that a fitting in with our entire framework for all the programs we do that allows them to to be joyful that allows them to be an educator and to have a, a positive uh, emotional return on investment and to be able to quench their own intellectual curiosity and thirst for knowledge to transmit that knowledge to other uh, people and to be happy, joyful, appreciated, and content while doing so. So what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful series. This specific show topic is the most important teaching tool is passion. Really? The most important teaching tool is passion? Really? And so... This is a somewhat provocative, somewhat provocative title. It's a provocative episode. The premise is that passion, when you pull up your, your tool chest as an educator and you've got all kinds of things in your tool chest, you've got time management, you've got self-discipline, you've got uh, high level uh, specialized skills in a different, different areas where subject matter experts, you have um, your own temperament whether you're a patient person and and within this big tool tool kit or tool chest one of the tools is passion but 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 is it the most important teaching tool for an educator let's discuss so the first thing of course is what is passion generically we're just using the concept of, of passion as a, as a heightened level of, of excitement and engagement and the argument that I'm uh, analyzing is whether or not the educator themselves is engaged at a heightened level with the content is either an important teaching tool, the most important teaching tool, or not important at all. And when we look at the, the the whole discussion in education, of course, which is just fascinating, globally there's just amazingly interesting discussions about education from you know the very early childhood education up up into uh, sort of a, a primary or secondary level uh, in many parts of the world, and then through uh, college or university. It's just an amazing field with all sorts of research and and debates and and I'm riveted. <laughs> you know, I, daily I read uh, a lot of. Uh, educational uh, media directed toward educators and I'm, I'm just always every day I'm, I'm looking through these 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 uh, periodicals and thinking this is just a fascinating field and it's interesting because I've shared another uh, education Eden series you know some of my own sort of fervent belief um, you know Nelson Mandela called education a, a weapon that it was just a powerful you know that it, literally it's something that's not sort of oh wouldn't it be nice but it's it's a tool for for power um and even in ancient societies ancient philosophers sort of made the argument that there's nothing there's no better calling there's nothing more uh, important or fundamental or what makes humans uniquely human is the idea of, of ideas and education and the ability to transmit knowledge and so i'm just in, enthralled by this area and the question of whether or not passion is, is an important tool for teaching or 
the most important or not important at all is I think something that when we look at out based outcome based decision making is something I don't think we can ignore so in other words uh, I, I mentioned that there's a lot of debate at every level of education and a lot of the debate at least in a lot of uh, Western media in the U.S., for example, is focused around outcomes, right? So, you know, everything from early childhood acquisition of language, uh, larger vocabulary, um, helping children learn behavioral skills, um, uh, patience, self-discipline, delayed gratification. Of course, as children become older, what is the appropriate measurement of what would be the subject matter mastery at different at different ages? Uh, of course, that's also uh, then challenged by, well, will some people have different um, sk skill sets or different uh, ability levels that they bring? So even though they might be a certain age, or does that mean that they should be in a certain grade? And even if they are in that grade, does that mean that they should be held to the same standards of, of other children that might have different um, skill sets or abilities. Plus, again, children enter education systems already with either huge advantages or disadvantages based on who they were around from from birth on and, and, and whether or not people spoke to them. And if they did, what type of vocabulary and language did they use? Did they model for them um, appropriate grammar uh, for their their primary or secondary languages or tertiary languages for that matter matter so so many variables go into this and then there's such passion right that's our <laughs> we're trying to talk about passion for teachers but there's so much passion for all of the stakeholders and in, in these education debates because you're when you talk about a parent or a, a person who's a, a legal guardian and it's their their you know progeny or their legal responsibility and especially when there's a very um powerful emotional aspect to it then you get advocacy where people just feel like there's almost literally nothing more important right than their child or their grandchild or their their um adopted child or their guardian the, the child they're guardian of and that's the whole future right that's that child's entire life and that and and for especially people sometimes who see themselves in their children they feel it's also their lives and their future and people are just incredibly um focused on their point of view and what outcome they want and everybody would argue they want the best for their individual child the challenge is what happens with the collective group as we said earlier do we set sort of common expectations or standards or tests or common core of what we expect someone to know at a certain age and then who do we hold accountable if they don't know that is it teachers is it administrators what do we need to do do we need teachers to have higher credentials and in terms of being subject matter experts should they have higher level degrees or more time intensive programs um there's so many different debates and the exciting thing is that teachers educators are in the middle of this exciting time and as as you look at outcomes every sector of society is invested in the discussion about education because you you know you look at the business sector right which i which is where i spend a, a lot of my time then you know businesses i need i need i need people i either need people to 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 do stuff in my organization but at a larger scale i need people to innovate new things i need people to create new businesses i need people to come up with new technology and invent new ideas where do you get those people and 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 do we have enough people um to be able to uh, stay uh, um, globally competitive. Every country in the world is asking this. So politicians care about it. Every so single sector of the economy cares about it. Um, you know, this is everything. What is a society or a culture other than individuals with with some sort of contribution or, or skill set? Education is how that happens. And I think it's exciting. <laughs> I also understand, though, that when there's such a, a vocal an animated discussion about what makes a quote good teacher or what what should we what should be the measurement of whether or not someone is an effective teacher and you start looking at everything from you know what are the what are the child's test scores uh what is the child able to produce on a on a standardized test um and you see this at the college and university level you know we a whole the same discussion right what is a degree worth if if the if the person is able to obtain the degree but they're not able to perform sort of 
minimum expectations that an employer would have or that a society would have. And so all of these are, again, I think they're exciting and, and exhilarating and wonderful and, um, you know, something that we can all have a position in and, and listen f- and, and to other people. And when we look at what educators can do, in a way it's a little bit unfair because the educator in the educational event and experience is limited. At the core issue, the educator has knowledge and they're going to transfer that knowledge to the student or pupil. And so ideally what you want in an educator is someone who has a curiosity and a thirst for knowledge. And that, that, that acquiring knowledge brings them some level of satisfaction or happiness or joy or contentment, whatever you want to call it. But if you have somebody who's just absolutely not curious at all and doesn't ever have any interest in, in any new knowledge, then typically that's not going to be someone who will be an effective educator. You, you, you typically want to have that, that person who themselves is, is um, pleased by acquiring information. The second part, though, is just because someone really enjoys acquiring information doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have this, the, mo- the second part of the skill set, which is the transferring knowledge. So when you look at the transferring knowledge, that's where the suggestion is that this concept of passion might be either an important tra- teaching tool or the most important teaching tool. So it, broadly, the idea is if you have somebody that themselves has a quest for knowledge and that makes that gives them some sort of pleasure or self-satisfaction to acquire new information and then they also have the desire and they have a positive uh, emotional and psychological uh, result when they try to when they transfer when they engage in the, the transferring of the knowledge that they've acquired then that's a rough <laughs> uh, recipe for an educator who is creating their own Eden meaning remember the educator is driven by their own drive and interest and in, in, in predilection so the, the first part was the educator likes new likes knowledge either or their you know broader breadth of knowledge or more depth of knowledge or a whole new area of knowledge whatever that but that process makes them in some way um, feel a positive return on their investment the second part is then they also enjoy sharing that knowledge or transferring that knowledge so that's creating Eden they themselves are just call it generically you know happy or pleased by learning something and they're really generically happy and pleased if they can transfer that to someone else so that's part of how they're creating Eden they're motivated to do this if you have somebody who's in education obviously who doesn't themselves have any interest in knowledge and they don't have any interest in transferring it to other people then this then it's not going to be an Eden for them it could even be a horrible you know nightmare because they're not happy this isn't you know they're not sort of internally motivated in this area so we're, we're taking our educator has it sort of either pre-existing or it was reinforced by their environment or both where they have a quest for knowledge and they enjoy acquiring knowledge and then they also have the the, the complementary skill and desire and interest in transferring and sharing the knowledge now again there are many people who who have a great passion and excitement for acquiring knowledge it makes them happy but they do not at all enjoy the part that you have to interact with another person and transfer that knowledge. That's just not what they like. They just like the part where they themselves acquire new knowledge. And that becomes a challenge when you look at when you look at teaching, especially where I've spent the majority uh, or almost exclusively my time as an educator uh, in, in part-time and full-time t- teaching positions has been in, in the college and at mostly the university level. And that's sort of the, 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 I think part of the, the challenge is many people who love acquiring knowledge, of course, go through multiple uh, degrees through university systems and quite often pursue the highest level terminal degree in an area of a subject matter. And that's because they like acquiring knowledge. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if I, I had a, a relative since passed away, but since he was a baby, he just loved buildings and I'm, I'm not exaggerating as, like a, you know as a toddler and he not just he played with you know Legos and toys to try to make facsimiles of buildings but as soon as you know he would for fun as a young child read maps and what was he doing he was partially learning geography was fun for him but he was mostly learning about the different buildings in different places and 
literally from the time he was born to the time he, he passed away, he just loved buildings. He would get excited as a child. Uh, I remember going to the, the Space Needle in, in Seattle, which is a very tall structure, and just the excitement because it, everyone knew, knew like this, he just loves buildings and tall buildings and interesting buildings and different architects, and he loves maps and, and studying you know cities and density and that was just always there and it wasn't at all anything that anyone in that and 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 the family had any input on that i was aware of other than maybe some a- ancient ancestor um because nobody else talked about that or had any interest in it or did anything like that um professionally it was just from the very beginning until the very end the, just loved buildings and maps and that's what made him happy and he loved knowledge and so when you have somebody who from these very early times has areas that they're just passionate about and whether you know it's 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 architecture or it's music or it's you know ancient rome or it doesn't matter they just they love it so much and it makes them so happy that when you care about those people of course you want them to be happy so you want them to have as much of that knowledge as they can possibly acquire and a lot of those people are the exact people that go and obtain a doctorate and terminal degrees because uh, doctorate degrees because they're so excited and they want to know so much they actually get to a point where they want to create new knowledge and, and, and go out and explore in their in their area that makes them happiest what what else can they learn and that's that's to me sort of the, sort of the rough structure of education higher education I think functions quite well it allows that person who has just an incredible thirst for knowledge to go to higher and higher levels of of, of study and, 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 to, and toward the end to be able to create their own new areas of knowledge, the dissertation or, or whatever their um, advanced doctorate study uh, takes as a result. And these people are driven usually when they're happy and they're in their, and they're in their Eden is because they just love that knowledge. And they typically have that, that quest for the information. Plus often they have just a huge passion, excitement, um, and they're drawn to certain subject matter areas. So that is a great recipe for someone to become a fantastic scholar. The question is, do those people all possess the desire to actually transfer knowledge? And of course, the answer is no. It's it's an you know it's an absolute. We know they all don't. And you see this huge debate in, in at universities where well, some people say, well, that that's the part I love is the research. That's what makes me happy is acquiring knowledge. That's what I do. That's why I'm here. Uh, that makes me wake up in the morning excited and giddy, and I'm thrilled to be out acquiring knowledge. That's what I want to do. But then you put them in classrooms to transfer it transfer it and that's not what makes them happy that's not their skill set it's not their joy and you have a clash and the, and the challenge of course when you look at how different nations are approaching this is you know what do you do you know how do you best serve the needs of the individual I'm going to take an ethical framework here and meet the the greater good the needs of the of the many so if there's somebody who has sort of these these talents skills and passions and you provide them a, a place to go to the, to, to the, you know, beyond the highest level that's known in, in research and in new knowledge, do you then also require them to, to, to transfer that knowledge and teach it, especially if there's a gap? A lot of people who have very heightened levels of knowledge, of course, operate at, at, at very sort of detailed, comprehensive levels. And it is, they actually sometimes might enjoy transferring knowledge to some learners but they typically will get more frustrated the less the learner knows about the area so it's very difficult for them to 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 to, um communicate to somebody who just has either zero knowledge or information uh and and so you'll you'll this is a huge thing in universities around the world what do you do so the argument of whether or not teaching is an important whether or not passion is an important teaching tool is the second part of this. Part of my personal opinion is that, that researchers and, and, and scholars need to be supported and, and all, of, all of humanity benefits. And we could sit here and talk just about, you know, discoveries and, and, and how all of us, literally every single one of us, has benefited from those, those, those small numbers of people that are that are sort of wired this way and also given the opportunity environment to to reach their highest levels they benefit everybody so I, I think we should continue to admire that and in my personal opinion invest in that that's not though necessarily somebody who's an educator that someone might be might be a researcher or a scholar an educator though enjoys the second part the part where I transfer knowledge and the question for this show is 
when you go to the transfer the knowledge, that's the teaching part. So acquiring it is 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 something where the the potential educator is, is the recipient, right? You're receiving knowledge, you're processing it, um, you're coming up with new um, questions to ask. The transferring it though is where you switch positions and you've, you've received knowledge, you're working through things, but you also at the same time now are going to begin to take some of the knowledge you have and transfer it to other other people. And for people who love that, people who love that connection, many people who love being educators and transferring knowledge get excited because they get to share. You know, it's one thing to have some super exciting thing that makes you gleefully happy, but the ability to take that joy and excitement and have other people be part of that and share into that is just exciting. And so even typically the most uh, focused researcher benefits from having even a small team of people who are, are are part of that research because it does give you some ability to share and and that and that and that love actually and so when you look at sort of the the broader based educator from pre-childhood all the way through university then how important is it that, that you're passionate and it seems a little unusual because obviously if we're talking in this framework of someone who's gone and acquired, you know, the highest level of terminal degree, then usually you're incredibly passionate because it takes so much sacrifice in terms of time, in terms of resources to achieve that. But that's not covering all educators. In many areas of, of education, there are there are maybe, you know, no formal educational requirements or, or especially when you start looking at some of the pre-K programs and working with younger children. So what do we as a society demand that an educator um, invest in terms of the two sides of the equation does every single person have to have this you know sort of either innate or um, supported long long held fa fascination with a certain area or is it okay for someone to sort of be you know older adult in life and say oh you know I'm in school I've always liked you know history I'm going to go ahead and get a get a history degree and then go ahead and get a certification and teach history to 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 12 year olds that's a question society needs to answer if you understand that the transfer of knowledge is a completely discrete skill from this sort of absorption and and, and sort of people who are intoxicated by absorbing knowledge then you have to ask, what's some, what are some of the most effective ways to reach the largest numbers? Now, again, this is not, I have a very uh, narrow, um, specific area of expertise, and I, there's five people in the world I'm going to try to transfer this to, and, um, and then I'll go to you know, some conferences, and I'll, and I'll have a very small group of people who even understand the questions I'm posing. I'm talking sort of a broader societal issue about educators, which is, again, every single level from, the, from literally the, the earliest uh, um, childhood development all the way through the highest levels of, of, of terminal degrees and beyond, what's the purpose of this as our society and how do we as educators find our own Eden? My argument would be that if you're not highly engaged and enthusiastic about what your subject matter is that you are assigned to or have accepted an assignment to teach to other people, that you are not going to be very effective. And I certainly think anecdotally we can all think of some of the, quote, our best teachers, right? It wasn't necessarily that the person had the highest amount of, of terminal degrees. It might have just been that the person was able to convey to us in a way that we understood and were able to hold on to and retain information and skills. So the transferring knowledge is, is at some level effective when the transfers happen, when it's complete, when the, when the recipients receive some knowledge and is able to use it, apply it, and retain it. So what is it that's going to get the attention of someone who, if the if this if the pupil or the student themselves isn't doesn't have a lot lifelong fascination of the area, they're just taking it because it's required, right? I have to take this class. It's part of my degree plan. They told me I had to. All right, great. So how do you reach that student? And how do you also deal with educators who it might not the area the subject matter itself might not be their most passionate, excited field, but they've met whatever the qualifications are in that part of the of the world in that jurisdiction and there they are for people especially who are the disinterested people who do not have a, a sort of a preset um, anticipation and eagerness toward this this concept or this area then the passion the ability for for 
the the educator to demonstrate through their every tool that they have right their voice their writing their body language um that this is something that's exciting and important to them is important and helpful in getting the attention of people especially your distance or should learner I would argue that passion, though, doesn't need to be thought of in some stereotypical manner of somebody who's, you know, maybe very gregarious, very boisterous, very kinetic. It doesn't have to be that. Passion just means that the person is able to convey authentically that this is something that's important and interesting and a positive thing in their lives. That's what we talked about creating Educators Eden, right? So that educator, it might not be that it was her lifelong dream to teach history to 12 year olds but it is interesting to them they do like it and they're happy that's why it's part of Eden and they found parts of it of the class or the way that they communicate or maybe the age of their pupil that's just fun and interesting to them and that fuels even more excitement there's nothing more again contagious than somebody who cares about something and one of the things I, when I was putting this uh, program together and thinking about, okay, passion, a lot of the, the argument would be, well, a lot of people will express themselves differently. You can't expect all these educators to be entertainers, which is a whole different debate that we're going to do a show on. Uh, but I think it's, that's a misunderstanding of what passion is. And a, an example that I have, and I'm not, that, that was very effective for me was, um, it was a public educational show in, in Canada and the U.S. And the, the host was, a gentleman named Fred Rogers, and the show was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And this show ran, I think, first in Canada, and then it ran in the U.S. from, like, 1968 until 2001, new episodes. That's a long time for one television show with one host. And I watched the show a lot as a young person. And uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, if you've never seen it, I strongly encourage you to go online and look at some clips. Mr. Rogers was the antithesis of showbiz you know, high energy, uh, short attention span, you know, camera cuts or anything of that nature. It was uh, is the opposite. It was a very sort of laconic style. But I felt so connected to the person who hosted the show and, and the show itself that emotionally, I have to say, as an adult, uh, Mr. Mr. Rogers uh, passed away, I think, in 2003. And when he when he passed away I felt like I'd literally lost like like a personal friend and I learned so much from that show I learned so much now of course I never was in the same room with Mr. Rogers I never met Mr. Rogers but I watched it very consistently and the the show for years and I just learned so much about imagination about the world and my argument is you can be passionate in whatever way fits who you uniquely are and be incredibly infect, effective in transferring knowledge and to me that again I do encourage if you've not seen this show Mr. Rogers Neighborhood to go you know look online look at some of the examples but just an incredibly effective educator so there's no argument that oh educators have to be you know some sort of Oh, pupils have short attention spans. You've got to, you know, keep it exciting and 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 make it, you know, more more entertainment oriented than than content. That's absolutely not accurate. And I think that's an excellent example of um, an educator who was very passionate and used his personality and his skills to draw in very young pupils and to teach lessons that I've retained to this day. And again, I never had the fortune ever of meeting meeting or talking to personally um, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, but I honestly grieved. I'm not kidding. I grieved when I'd heard that he passed away just because he, I felt so much of a presence and I felt that he'd enriched my life. And when we look at educators and teaching, there's so many, again, the debates about outcome and measurement and tests and common core and different ability levels. I mean, there's so much of this. But at sort of a basic level have you been able to transfer knowledge has that person been able to apply and retain that knowledge have you have they walked away from that transfer a richer person a better person at some level if you think having more information is an asset and I say that that I think is a great example your passion will come through you and your personality and if it's authentic 
it will be effective. If you don't care about what you're teaching and you don't care about your students and you don't care about anything, and unfortunately I have had some experience, very minor, uh, in terms of percentage of, of educators I've been around, but I have experience and seen people who don't care. And if you don't care, the people doesn't care. And if you care, really care in your own way, you will reach that pupil because they might not understand the depth of, of excitement. They might not understand the nuance. They might not understand maybe even why. But they will understand that you do care. And if you care about the content in some way, and I'm, this is, I'm just being as honest as I can, even through a television set, I felt that, that Mr. Rogers cared about me. And if that can happen through that medium and that distance, then certainly either in person or online, directly communicating to students in, in writing, their, their investment in themselves, if somebody else cares about me, it means there must be something about me that's worth caring about, right? They begin to invest in themselves and they begin to explore what they're capable of and that to me begins to unleash these, these powerful weapons um, that education can provide for people. So I would conclude that, that passion is the most important teaching tool. Of course, within that framework of someone who loves transferring knowledge and, and loves transferring knowledge to that, to that pupil base, and that pupil knowledge base. Uh, an age and development level but I, I I'm getting emotional just talking about how much I was influenced by an educator I never met never even was close to but I felt like like he was part of my life and I really a lot of the lessons I feel I've learned I've tried to this day to hold on to so thank you so much for being educators thank you for joining me in this educators Eden series the most important teaching tool is passion really and as always you can come to Courtney Anderson.com for more information.